Well, the truth is, I've I've always written. I've always, you know, I find it much more natural. Uh, from I find it much easier or much more natural just to write ideas down and to write things than I ever would to sit and draw something. So that's it's my natural sort of go-to thing, really. And I've always, you know, for years and years, I've been trying to write novels that never um, successfully. Last year, I think, I spent six months where I didn't do anything other than try to write this play. I just sat here at my desk and I wrote this play kind of obsessively. And it was crap when I finished. And I couldn't bring myself to go back to it. So, and, and within my work, you know, I mean, I, I write, I've, over the years, maybe in the last 10 years, I've written things for Arena On Plus um, quite a lot. And they all tend to be about the same thing, which is usually sort of middle-aged men uh, uh, who often have something in common with me or I, I like them for some reason or whatever it is. So um, wait, did you, did you write that even before maybe you were in that category or...? Uh, and, and I don't know, actually. Um, that's a good point. No, I think there's always... Um, I don't, you know, it's difficult. It's a very complex thing for me, but I think it tends to be a lot of working classness and there tends to be a lot of northernness yeah. you know, all these things that I come from and there's a lot of pop and so you know it, it very much is my world but there's you know I am very aware I think one of the things that I kind of I'm not great at writing fiction I'm kind of good at write. I'm good at rewriting fact as it's kind of semi-fiction faction they call it don't they mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um if I dare say I'm good at it I think that's what I'm best at at least and so but the complexity and the sort of difficulty I have becomes from this kind of idea that I'm now sitting in, you know, our house in Highbury, you know, you know, where it's quite genteel. I'm not, you know, and I'm talking about another world. And so inevitably went like the stories you mentioned, which are on my website, um, one of which is about my granddad and one of which is about um, a thing that happened in Sheffield. And a new one I'm doing is about a bloke who I knew when I was growing up in Gould, the town I come from. So there are all these kind of sort of, you know, I hate to say nostalgic, because but they kind of, there's an element of nostalgia, but they're very much about this this kind of past, and they're based on this kind of past. You know, I grew up in a kind of small council estate in in near this town called Goo, which is basically a small port town in a field. You know, so the, there's definitely a kind of nostalgia on my part. I think a longing for this imaginary past, which mm -hmm. is what nostalgia is, of course. Um, but but I think it's more than that. I think it's un, I think it'd be a bit unfair on myself to say they're nostalgic because they, 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 there's more to them than that. And also, I've started to think about what what is it I do because I never really know. And I think I think that what I'm doing or trying to do is sort of do something about memory or my memory more than nostalgia. So I mean, for example, I've done like I did a show at Studio Voltaire a few years ago, which is called uh, Welcome to Saxnot, which is about this fictional sort of corporation called Britlins, based on, I don't know if you know what Butlins is, but Butlins is this kind of very sort of cheap, very, you know, essentially working class, um, you know, uh, holiday business, which has kind of gone, which was enormous in the, from the thirties up until really the seventies, when it started to go downhill, when British people started to go, you know, travel to Spain cheaply and things like that. And, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, anyway, yeah. so the, the, the welcome to Saxon thing was uh, a fantasy idea where, uh, in in the wake of the Brexit vote, where Britain would be turned into a 1970s holiday camp, it'd be remodelled as a 1970s holiday camp, which is a satirical idea because these places were essentially white working class. It wasn't. It's quite complicated given what I just said, but it was really a kind of satire about people like Farage and this kind of fantasy that they were trying to project onto. I felt well, I think it's true onto a lot of working class people that there was once a better Britain, which is very much a mm. Cameron line. But you know, a lot of the Brexit but certainly from working class people, I think, if I dare say, came from a, a nostalgia they'd been peddled about how Britain used to be. Mm -hmm. And so I took the kind of working class Brit Butlins holiday resort idea, which if you look at the imagery of it was done, you know, the kind of propaganda of these places was done with these brilliant, brilliant postcards, which which just looked like Wizard of Oz, you know, these beautiful postcards, which when Martin Parr collected them and made a book of them, and there are these kind of hands retouched, recolored photographs mm -hmm. of this idealized world. And so what I was trying to project really was really through the postcards and through people's memories, because of course a lot of people my age and much older still remember going there as a kid or you know going there as adults. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, so the, the, the idea of Britlings uh, and Welcome to Sex Not was really about fantasy. It was, it was a kind of I was trying to create a kind of parallel world that the likes of Farage had created, you know, mm -hmm. in memory. 
this memory. Mm -hmm. So, but as I say, it's quite complicated because I have my own fond memories of going to Butlins as well, you know, very deep nostalgic things, uh, and particularly of going to Filey Butlins, which is a, which was one, which was the biggest camp, I think it was, in fact, it was the biggest Butlins camp. It was like a small town. Mm -hmm. And I went there as a seven year old in 1977. And I went there just before it closed in 1983 for a week, even though we didn't know it was going to close. Wow. And when they closed it, they erased it. It was flattened. This whole camp, which was the size of a small town, was totally erased and was built, they built these kind of new build barrett barrack type houses on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I have this very strong thing about that because, of course, I have these very clear memories of going there as a child. And um, now there's, not, there's no physical evidence of that now. I mean, there are postcards and there are photographs and there are people's stories and you can find them online and there's my own memories, but there's, the place is erased, you know. So it's very poignant to me that um that point really um i don't know if i'm answering the question or if i've gone off on a tangent here no 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 but i think that um in a in a, in a, in a way you're talking about um well you're talking about self-referential aspect of your work i guess yeah yeah and well, what, what, one way to sort of and, get to this point i think i think to be honest with you what well, the reason i started going on about the welcome to sex not brittling's idea is because in a way i'd imagine that as a novel i think or as some kind of written mm -hmm. thing and i think it would have Con been conveyed much more clearly as that because it's a fiction it's or it's a fiction even though it comes from a real thing yeah, exactly yeah, yeah 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 and you know i you know my <clears throat> yeah as i say i think i'm good at um I, you know the, the best things i've written i think are, apart from these kind of well, well these stories are a different thing but the best things i've written are probably uh where I've had a subject, you know, for example, I, I got a motorbike that I really wanted to, through Arena on Plus, I borrowed a motorbike this, um, which a few years ago, it was like the fastest production motorbike you could buy, a racing motorbike essentially on the road from right, IBM. Right. And I managed to borrow one so I could go and see George Shaw, the painter, who's a friend of mine when he right, lived, in, right, he lived right. in Devon. So I kind of doubled up on that. I kind of thought, wanted to get this motorbike, I couldn't afford it. So I managed to borrow it for a week, or whatever it was, and then went to George and I wrote about George. So that gave me a very solid, you know, you've got an, immediately, you've got a kind of uh, road movie. Yeah. Uh, with an end point and the end point is George my time with George so that gives me a good structure and I'm quite I'm good at that because I can then take the facts and I can sort of embellish them basically and I'm, that's the kind of writing I think I'm good at and, and with the stories that you mentioned which are now on my website they're both true stories although they're incredibly embellished and yeah. that's 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 what I'm very interested in doing at the moment um, are they I, are they actually written stories which you then read out uh, no, I don't write them down. I just I just do them in one take, but I have to do thirty takes to get to the final one. So I kind of I'm very bad at reading off a of sheet of paper as well. You know, I, I'm really bad at it. I'm not great because they're so incredibly performed. That was something that really struck me is that I, I can tell that you're not reading it, but at tell. the same time, well, I could tell that you're not reading it, or, or, you're, or you're just a very good actor <laughs> as well. So I just couldn't quite work out. So, yeah, yeah, no, they're definitely, no, they're, I don't know, I'm sure there's a much more efficient method than mine, and I use this, you know, I just use, I just use this. Right. This, uh, hence the crackle and the bad sound and everything. Um, and I just, I just keep doing this, I, I don't even know how to edit those, so, so you can get them as MP4s, and I, I'm sure you can edit them very easily, of course you can, but I don't know how to do it, so I have to do the whole take again. So, well, so over a period of, I don't know, a month, I'll maybe sort of, I'll listen back to the story, then I'll think actually it'd be better if I added a piece here and this would make more sense. And I just sort of edit it in my mind and then I do it again. So that's how I've been doing it, but I'm sure there's a better way to do it. But no, but I think <laughs> there must be there must be something in that process, in the process of repetition and repetition and repetition. I, I think there is. And I suppose if you look at any kind of comic, you know, even a good one, they tend to tell the same stories over and over again. I mean, Billy Connolly famously, you know, tells us the same stories for 50 years. And they all have their set stories, don't they? And I guess they get better at selling, at telling the the story, and they embellish the story. And also, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of it taps into tradition. It taps into this idea of folk memory, doesn't it? And stories been yeah. st there's been quite a lot it's written about and repeated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, we we know this is the kind of idea of tribal elders, you know, historically passing on. You know, that's where myth comes from, of course. Yeah. That, you know, mythological stories come from that, and. Um, yeah, and I know there's a great kind of tradition. I, there's, there's a book which I can't find, but it's about it's about kind of the, the power of um, spoken word stories within working class communities, and I can't remember what it's called. But I was quite pleased when I sort of came across that because I'd never thought about that as a notion. But of course, it, it's not mm -hmm. just working class. We all grow, don't you? You know, you know stories about your grandfather or grandmother. Mm -hmm. 
And these stories, you know, there's some of them are funny and some of them are sad or, you know, but the stories are embellished over time and the stories become warped, of course. And the two yeah. stories that you're referring to that are on my website, I keep saying it as if I'm trying to get people to look at my website, which I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, the first one which I did is called uh, Royal Castle and the Vandellas, which is a, was a true story, which was told to me by my very, very old friend, uh, Jamie Fry. And Jamie Fry lived in Sheffield in the early 1980s. And he was told that story when he was there by a man called John Carruthers, who ended up, who was a guitarist and ended up uh, being in uh, the Banshees. Mm. But John Carruthers had been there that night in mid 1970s Sheffield when this event happened. So, the, of course, the story went, you know, so John Carruthers told the story six years after the event. So he's definitely embellished the story when it gets to my friend Jamie in 1981 or two. And then Jamie's been telling me this story for at least 20 years. So, in my mind, it's nice. kind of become something else. So, my version that ends up as my story is probably enormously untrue, but yeah. the, the, but the essence of truth is that, you know, the events are true, you know, it's kind of true. And similarly with my granddad, with the war story one, as I think I say in the story, he wouldn't tell me ab about anything that happened in the Second World War. And it's a kind of great cliche, of course, that the men who are involved wouldn't talk about it. Uh, but, you know, obviously with good reason, I suppose. And my granddad would never tell me anything except this story about how he was dumped in the desert in Egypt going through the and, tents and, and he had to go and he had to find a tent for the night you know and he did tell it like you know I've exaggerated but he did tell it it used to go on and on because he'd tell you about one one. by yeah, one yeah, yeah yeah so I did you know so the elements that that are absolutely so, so this true. was this was done in when was this done in 2020 uh, these two stories I'm just kind of trying to put it in context whether it's it, it has I anything think, to do with I think, um, the, I think the first one was done maybe in the summer and the second okay. one, which, you know, the first one being the Roy, Roy and the Vandellas was done, I think, in summer. And the second one was done in about November, I think. Um, and was there yeah. was there a moment during the during this kind of series of lockdowns that we've gone through that you've... Or your, your work is always self-referential, but I'm just wondering whether at some point there was like an additional urge to revisit the um, personal history. Um, I don't know if lockdowns forced that i mean there's a you know he could i mean i well, would have maybe that. done it anyway yeah. well yeah but i always loved that bruce nauman idea and i remember reading this somewhere as a student that bruce nauman as a young artist did you know trying to make art that people would notice and that would satisfy himself and he realized he was just sitting in this kind of blank room this studio his own yeah. studio with nothing and he decided that was his environment and the art that he made would come from that environment and I really like the idea. I like the idea that you're not, that, that, that you know, you, you don't have to have outside references. And I think for me, what, if you look at my design work from being very young, it's always about stripping things right down, you know. So there's, yeah. there's, there's an element of storytelling right from the off, and there's an element of kind of, you know, sort of situationist influence, this idea of provocation as well as kind of detournement and things like that. But but aesthetically, you know, stylistically, or whatever we call it, it's always been quite bare. And so, and my pursuit, if I was really honest, and, you know, I I remember, and this is, I've never told anybody this, but I, I remember being a student and writing down like this, this line, and at the beginning of the line in a circle, it said graphic design, and then there was an arrow pointing to the middle, and then it said fine art. And then it said, and then there's another arrow pointing to the end, and another circle, and it said writing. And that was kind of, from very young, I had it in my head that I might have this kind of path that I'd try and do these things. I was definitely doing graphic design and I would become a graphic designer. But really, I wanted to do some kind of art, which well, to me was a very high thing above me. But ultimately, I really wanted to be able to write. And if you're right, you know, if you're not an investigative, investigative journalist, if you are writing some kind of mm -hmm. fiction or if you're writing stories that are based on facts, but essentially from your own mind, then the in the end, it is only you and those words, I think, mm. which, you know, so if you go from stripping down graphic design to its various typography, you know, it, it, there's a kind of, if you're going to pursue that, there's almost an inevitable point where you have to create your own words and whether words are more important than the font, or what, you know what I mean? So, But also um, that the graphic design is about communicating something very clearly. And then I guess it could be also a progression of diluting the kind of clarity of, the message. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I, I, you know, I'm 51 years old, so I hate to go on about something I did 30 years ago, but the, it was, you know, I did certain things in my final year at college where I realised that, because I was scared of doing graphic design, 
Mm -hmm. I started off doing illustration, but my illustrations were kind of very bad, sort of sub, sub Jean Michel Basquiat kind of scribble. And I knew I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't really interested in being an illustrator, but I just, but I chose it because this was before everybody had computers and this is before you could actually make real graphic design. You know, you had to sort of fake it. So to me, at least illustration, mm. at least you were making a real drawing. And that's what I kind of liked rather than faking in typography and stuff like that, because this is really before, this is pre-Mac, you know, so there's no real way to, to make proper graphic design as it were. Um, but I was scared of doing graphic design because it, it seemed to be ruled by these kind of men who had, had rules, you know, there was this kind of, you know, it was all about craft and all about expertise and all about knowing mm -hmm. this about fonts and stuff like that, which I didn't. And I mean, I, didn't, I do now more, but not really compared to someone like Fraser Muggeridge or a real graphic design, you know. So, but what I did realize was that I could make the content and I made a magazine, which was written by myself and designed by myself. I made this po certain post, I won't, I'm not gonna talk about them because I've spoken about them so many times, but I made posters that were site specific with words on written by me. And I realized that my interest in typography or design was really about the content and about the positioning of the, of, of the work, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 I, this kind of idea about subject, medium and context and how you, the, the interchange between these three elements. And for me, it was about using graphic design to say what I wanted to say, literally, to say what mm -hmm. I wanted to say, not just because I wanted to do it in this style. It was about, it was very much about, I suppose you would, you could argue, I guess, using graphic design more like a conceptual artist rather than rather than becoming an expert expert mm -hmm. graphic designer. That was my. That's how it kind of worked for me then. So when you when you say about, I think this is really interesting that you kind of almost had a drawn up this um, trajectory <laughs> yeah. from graphic designer to a writer. Um, and because, I mean, I, I personally feel myself being on a, on a kind of trajectory, not exactly sure where exactly it's going, yeah, but I mean. uh, this idea of um, kind of going from one profession to the other or mm. somehow making certain transitions or adjustments that will just allow you to communicate, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a good word, isn't it? To al allow you to communicate. I think that's yeah. very important, isn't it? Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm a trained architect and, you know, yeah. I spent five years working in an architectural practice and then I just felt like it just, it just doesn't give me enough uh, freedom or... It seems to be um, very common with architects that, that mm. um, I know, for example, Chris Lowe from the Pet Shop Boys, I don't want to be a name dropper, but Chris trained as an architect and he said he spent four years designing a toilet or something once he graduated, or it was something like that, or a staircase. I think he was quite That's very likely, yeah, yeah. He's quite proud of his staircase, but he said it wasn't what you imagined. Yes, and it's a, crea it's a creative profession, yet it, um, it's very slow, right, in comparison yeah. to, to graphic design, where you can just draw something and instantly, um, like, yeah. use it to communicate, in a, in uh, a sense. Well, I guess you can. It, it depends who you're working with. But of course, if you're just doing yeah. it for yourself, you can. In the same way, you know, you can make imagine, imaginary buildings if you're an architect. Yeah, no, you know, yeah absolutely. Is that, what's it called? It's a great Russian tradition, isn't it? Is it called paper architecture? Yeah, paper architecture. Yeah, yeah. so there, there is that element, which, which of course, we, we get, then we're getting closer towards what we imagine an artist is, aren't we? You know, where you're yeah, free to, yeah, you're free exactly. to use, you know, you're, you're using the skills of applied design and technolo technolo technological, you know, elements as an architect, I guess. But essentially, you're thinking like an artist. You're using the, your skills and tools to make in a, a form of art, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess you're removing certain constraints that um, the, yeah, the kind right. of profession imposes, yeah. right? Yeah. The client, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Is it, and Mr. John Sloan, who, again, is a classical architect, right. um, is um, yeah, had all these imaginary projects. Right, yeah, um, yeah. Well, um, I, I was very interested in that, and I still am, and I've done, I now did a book once called uh, Public Art, and it comes from my interest as, again, as a kind of student, really, I was very interested in Super Studio, or the early work, you know, and forgive forgive my pronunciation if it's wrong, but Coupe Mont Blanc. But yeah. they start, I mean, they still exist in a form, but they, they were, they started in the late 60s and they were kind of this politicized Austrian, I think, architects. It made things like a, a university that buried itself and a flat with a burning wing and stuff like that. And I was very excited by that. A friend of mine, he's sadly no longer around, but a friend of mine introduced me to them and, and that was very, very exciting to me because they were just works of the imagination, I suppose. And that's yeah. something that I think certainly in the graphic in graphic design in those days, in the course I was on, it wasn't encouraged. You know, just meant to get a yeah. job, you know. So all these kind of things, I mean, my sort of real, apart from a kind of egotistical one, my 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 kind of wanting to be an artist or, or you know, to be in that world of art 
initially when I was younger was because I imagined it was a world of freedom, you know, which yeah. I, I thought you wouldn't get in graphic design. And it's not quite true, of course, because if you're a successful artist you, you, and you want to carry on being one, you're bound really to make, keep making a version of what made you successful, you know, so. That's um, interesting, yeah. Your work is also actually in some sense um, quite um, architectural. I mean, I, I can see quite a lot of architectural oh, yeah. references. Uh, I mean, from tracing a house. Uh... Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, it's, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I mean, my dad, you know, my dad was absolutely determined that I would be an architect. You know, that that was his big thing because I was kind right. of right at right. school and and I was good at art. And from from his background and doing, you know, he's a kind of engineer fitter, you know, and, and he's retired, obviously, but that's the only way he could make sense of me being sort of arty was that I would become become an architect and this would become his great proper dream. profession a real a real profession yeah that yeah. Would became his great dream but of, about how I'm an absolute moron at maths and sciences and things like that so I, it was never going to happen but um so there might be a kind of if you notice this architectural element in what I do it might there might be some kind of lost longing yeah. or kind of subconscious yeah, there yeah. might be some aiming to please my dad I don't know yeah um, no, but I do have an interest. I, I'm not an expert by any means on architecture, but it's more, it just stems from these, it really stems from this Coop and Brown Super Studio interest as, and this kind of, uh, you know, possibilities of, it just, it's really just because they're ideas, I guess. And, yeah. and it's very exciting. And they come from a different field. Yeah, yeah. And maybe um, that's important that they're from a different field, therefore I don't have to get very involved, therefore it's not real work mm. and it's just fantasy. Maybe that's an element of it, you know. Mm. So I'm just wondering if um, if we now talk about this trajectory, which I'm glad you mentioned because I, I was going to I was going to ask you about it. Yeah, I wasn't sure how to put it because I wasn't sure whether it was a conscious thing or not. Um, going from one thing to the other to the other. Um, so going from magazines to maybe artwork to I guess what you're trying to do now is actually go to the third stage of your. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the right age for the third stage. Yeah, um, yeah. You've had enough experience. Or... I think so. Um, it, it's it's difficult. I can only try and be truthful, and it, and, I, and it is this thing that I actually, you know, I, I do write naturally, whether I'm any good or not. But I very naturally start writing. It's a very mm -hmm. and I very much get involved and enjoy Instincts. doing that. Yeah. If I had to do that for a living, I probably wouldn't want to do it. That's and that's a very important element, I think. And it's it's this kind of longing to do something that you're not doing. Isn't it? I mean, I always yes, yes, I, yes. In, in, in everything for me, I always want to be somewhere else, and I want to be doing something yeah. else. You know, so if I did, if I had, for example, now a design, which I have a design job to, to do a record cover, for example, I'd want to do anything except the record cover. Yes. And I desperately think, and I and I think this is a really great time to start my novel. You know, because I'm, I'm supposed to be doing something else, you know. That's so exactly waste. how I feel <laughs> most of the time. So I'd waste, you know, weeks writing this stuff that might never materialise. And probably... But possibly. there is something that, there's something very contemporary in that, I think. It's almost like, um, uh, you know, in psychotherapy, they always try to identify what's our main urge in life, oh, you know, yeah, whether okay. it's a sex drive or whether it's uh, something but to do with childhood. Yeah. But then, but then somehow it could also be something to do with things that we don't have or knowledge that we don't have. Yeah. Desire, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I know what you mean. It's um, and I'm getting it wrong. Uh, well, I think that seems to be tr true, doesn't it? This, this kind of did this endless desire to be elsewhere or to to, to be to be mm. somehow more involved. That's the big thing for me. It's to something that because I've always been looking for something that's wholly. Uh, embracing and and, uh, and and demands my full attention and I can throw myself into it and I've never really found that I don't think I've never um it, it sounds I think the lack of commitment it's a kind of I mean why I get very I'm very excited by ideas really and that's my main thing and once I've had an idea I can see it through if I think it's good enough but it more likely I would have a really good idea yesterday and I'd write on my list of things to do today you must finish the idea and make it real and you know find out the production how are you going to make this and how are you going to pay for this and and of course i won't do that i'll start writing my novel again you know so it's and and, it, and i end up at my age with a kind of massive backlog of ideas and which, which is very very frustrating really um and if i was well, i guess some of them drop off they, well they do don't they or what i find more often is they mutate and what happens is you, these two yeah. half ideas become one whole idea that's what i found and so I mean, and I've kind of, 
I've actually learned to live with that really. And rather than, mm. I mean, I used to be very sort of angry about it, not being able to get things done. And, 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 uh, and now I think actually, if you're just calm about it, uh, the, something will happen. It'll be, if it's a good idea, it will live and there will be an outlet for it. Like, for example, you mentioned the rubbing of Ian Curtis's house, you know, the kind of wax rubbing of the full wax removal's house. And that's an idea that I'd, I don't remember, but it would, it would definitely be the sort of thing I thought of in a pub when I was talking to someone and we maybe it was like a half half a joke initially and then I thought thought about it and it's actually a very sincere thing and with that I thought well, that's never going to get done it almost got made in 2016 for a show that was curated by Matthew Higgs and John Savage in Manchester which was all about Geordie Vision New Order but then it was a bit because it's a very sensitive subject it's a bit too contentious and I thought it's never going to get made and then a friend of mine uh, Max Dax in Berlin curated a show about music and I told him about it when I was in Berlin and he made it happen really so um, mm -hmm. you know you've got to be patient I think with ideas sometimes yeah. especially the bigger ones you know that they involve you know I mean for for example that particular piece of work it, it needed a budget which wasn't huge but it did need a budget it needed a team of people and I was very lucky a friend of mine uh, Tom Godfrey took care of that but it requires scaffolding yeah scaffolding and and mm. and uh, yeah, finding the right paper that wouldn't rip away in the strong yeah. Cheshire winds and all this kind of thing. Right. But more, but at the end, of course, you needed a you needed a space that was big enough to show it, which is very very mm. difficult. And because it's uh, for I, again, my pronunciation may be wrong, but Diek to Harlan, Diek to Harlan, Diek to Harlan, you know Hamburg, uh, because they've got an enormous space and they're kind enough to finance it, that it, it existed, you know. So, um. Yeah, it's a case of it's a case of patience, I think. Yeah. So there isn't so there isn't really a conscious moment of shifts, like when you leave an, a, a magazine or, um, you know, are there any moments of kind of sh well, real I, shifts, or it yeah. is a really a kind of progression. No, I, I, well, for me personally, uh, well, it's to do with opportunities and lack of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an, always an underlying ambition to do whatever it is that you're trying to do, you know, whether it's just, yeah. even if it's just, I want to do something else. I think that emerges. I mean, you know, years and years ago when I went to ID and I was just, I just graduated, I was 23, I just turned 23. Mm -hmm. And I was there until I was 26. And when I was there, I look back now and I think I was, you know, very, very uh, ungrateful actually, but, I just desperately wanted to do, to have my own voice somehow. I felt that even working on what was then a very independent magazine ID seemed to be not my voice. And I was just a, like a graphic designer or an art director, you know, and it, somehow this wasn't good enough for me, which was ridiculous because it was an incredible opportunity mm. and I was stupid with it really. Um, but I really wanted to be this, an artist, a real artist. And I my sort of idea to start that somehow was to make this magazine called Crash, which was with my friend, Matthew Wall, who's a professor of history. And that, that was a very conscious shift. I mean, to make that magazine was very, very, very conscious thing. It was actually to, to weld together these kind of these kind of critical ideas and sort of situationist ideas with ID, the style magazine world. I wanted to bring these two things together. So sometimes I think it's quite conscious. And I think when you're younger, perhaps, it's easier to do that because you don't have, uh, well, you have the energy to do it and you have the yeah. ambition and you have the kind of, the, the kind of bravery of youth and all these things. And obviously, financially, you're not as beholden to other things. <laughs> <Strained> <laughs> <with> other <laughs> mortgages. So, um, uh, but I think I think it's absolutely brilliant when, for anybody, and certainly I feel it, when you do have a kind of you know, a clear, you want to make a clear shift, and you have the kind of the gumption and the determination to make it happen. I think that's very exciting, isn't it? Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't know for myself now. I don't know if I, if that. You know, I did actually, I confess, I wrote again for the first time in 30 years, I wrote, moved towards being a writer on this pad here. And it's the first time I've written it down since I've done my little line when I was 22 or whatever. So it's, it's. I think what, I think the idea of shift is, is also the idea of freedom, isn't it? Or you're searching for a kind of freedom. Because for me, if I just, had, if I could just write and not have to make any money out of it, that would be great, wouldn't it? But if I had to, if I was lucky enough to even be considered to be a journalist, and I had to write about, I don't know, name it, anything, almost anything at all, you would, maybe you wouldn't want to do it, you know. There might be one thing you want to write about, but then they make you write about, I don't know, some reality TV show or something. I don't know, you don't want to write about that. So maybe the reality is that we all have things we must do 
you know, to earn a living or because it's the skill that we skill set that we to have. To do the things that we want. Exactly. To do. <laughs> you know, well, almost like a hobby, you know, it's like, if you think yeah. about any, you know, I think about my dad and his whole life, you know, he worked in a factory, you know, he had a good job in a factory, but he worked in a factory and he hated it. And his whole life was about going shooting and fishing and they loved motorbikes. And this was his real life, you know, his family, of course, but his real passion was for shooting and fishing. So every, all his money that he could spare was geared towards going to Scotland to go salmon fishing, you know, or go shooting or whatever. And it might be, the reality for me might be that, you know, whatever I do, I have to do in order that I can have these hours spent writing my imaginary novel, which might never ever materialize. I don't know. But maybe that's the reality of what we all do is that we... And well, I guess that's the reality of being an artist. You kind of have to do what you feel like doing. And then it's a, it's a tricky balance, isn't it? But if, we, if, if the two things are the same thing, having and wanting, right, yeah. to, to do something, uh, whether that becomes about um, what being able to what well, being able to have an audience that's the kind of idea of commercialization um, is to kind of listen to audience and give them what they well, may, may well that's want. an interesting point that's an interesting point isn't it because of course I suppose successful people do that don't they you know and whether they say they do or they don't you know I, I don't suppose many artists would admit that they're doing this because they know it's going to work and sell and keep them in their pri position of privilege if they are in one. But of course, they do do that, really. And um, I mean, for me, to be honest, I've not really got much of an audience, I don't think. So it's kind of, and I certainly haven't got one in the art world where I make something and people are going to buy it. That doesn't happen anymore. It's all, not that it happened much. So it's not really an issue for me. I think for me, it's more of this, and it sounds very teenage and melodramatic, but there is an element of this kind of personal search, really, where you're trying to find something that you actually want to do. And, I, and I've constant I constantly when I get bogged down because I've got too many ideas and then I go back to this same line which which is that which is what do you want to do so for example it's a good a good example is going to see George Shaw on the fastest production motorbike in the world that's something I want to do you know it's very easy for me to do that because it wasn't work yeah. for me you know and so uh, similarly I think I've got to that point again where really what do you what do I want to do you know and 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 I, and I think it's important for anybody to I mean it you know whether they're an architect or an artist or anybody at all if they can if they can if they can to to keep constantly asking that question what do I want to do you know mm. and, and, and no, I think that's crucial and, and, and if if you if really if work is a very large part of your life that that thing of wanting to do something that will become your work anyway I think won't it because I mean I did a book my other bad, one of my many bad habits is, because I always had Lambrettas as a kid, you know, as a scooter boy. And it's a very big culture where, when, I, when I grew up and whereabouts I come from. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've not had a Lambretta for 10 years or more. But every day I look on eBay, UK, and I look at Lambrettas and I assess them. And I think, and I haven't got a garage or anything. I mean, you need a garage, a safe place to put it. I can't, yeah. can't live in a street, it'd be stolen immediately. And of course I haven't got a garage, but I look at them and I go through them every day and I sort of think, hmm, that's about a thousand pounds over price. Hmm, that, has that got a disc brake? No, hmm, that's only a 150 engine. So I know, because I have all this information that I've stored up for 35 years or yeah. more. And, and I just sit here one day thinking, fucking hell, I really should do some work, you know, because I'm just, you know, so I've spent an hour now looking at Lambrettas I'm not going to buy. And I thought, you know, what? I'll do a Lambretta guide. And I made a book um, yeah. a year or two ago, maybe, called, uh, uh, Lambretta and eBay users guide you know so I so I turned this kind of yes. sort of tragic passion into 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 work and I think to me that's when it's most like for example with the Ian Curtis house rubbing you know I'm you know as a you're, you're much younger person I was very obsessed by Joy Division so uh, the, the goal is isn't it I think and it's very obvious once you say it but the goal is to turn your true passions into your work isn't it um yeah and that's the ultimate I mean thing. it's incredible I'm wondering whether it's a mo uh, whether um, I mean, I'm just curious how, how your brain works, whether, whether during this process of obsessive checking of eBay, you realize <laughs> this is a, this is an obsession and then you suddenly realize, well, let's just turn it into a, into a, into a work. Yeah. Or, yeah. or was it, that's yeah. That's really so, what so, the alternative? Well, I guess you have, so, so then I guess you have this capacity of, um, identifying a kind of odd behavior and acknowledging it as a kind of uh, an obsession that yeah. then could easily turn into a, a work. 
Yeah. I, well, it's. I suppose the ultimate goal is 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 trying to make it not work, isn't it? You know, you're trying to make work out of your pleasure or your. And it goes back to this Bruce Nauman thing in a way that he was going to sit in that room all day anyway, so he may as well make that his art, really. Sophie Cowell, but the artist, you know, and, she, and she, she, her work is only about her obsessive behaviour, isn't it? That she followed, you know, the whole thing of stalking people that she made into her work, you know. And it's not real stalking, of course, she's following people because that's what she yeah. wanted to do. And I always admire that. And I, I always really like with Sarah Lucas, you know, I've kind of lost touch with, but I used to go into her house quite a lot and she'd just sit there drinking cans of beer and smoking fags and stuffing tights. And, you know, then the, then the cans of beer and the fags would be turned into art. And it's such a, you know, it's, yeah. it's again, it's the cliche of life as art and art as life. But it is that, it's that level of, you know, that's what a good artist can do, I think, is that it's not an effort and it's not, I mean, it might be, it might be, it might be torture sometimes, it might be agony sometimes, but, but to just be able to reach out and grab your own life and make that, the, the work and everything. I think that, that's, that's the idea, isn't it? So it becomes this effortless thing. I'm not sure if this quite connects, but I'm always quite jealous of, you know, pop groups and I think, you go to bed and your record has been played around the clock you know you're asleep and you're making not making much money nowadays from that but you know but not only are you making money out of it people are listening to it and liking your work while you're asleep you know which you could argue that for a sculpture but, you, but and then again you maybe not because galleries are not open 24 hours usually you know, so but the idea that somehow it's just this seamless blend which is very much a situationist sort of Guy Debord kind of thinking this kind of you know to, to break down any barrier between life and life so on a micro level I suppose that's my goal as well is that um you know for example remembering a story that I thought that actually I've never forgotten but I never consciously thought was something I could use like a story my granddad's story about the tent well that's not work to me that's just something that goes on in your mind anyway you know so, so to somehow for you know to sort of shape that and formulate it into a kind of something else is it's not easy but it's not doesn't feel like work you, you know what i mean and, and i suppose that's the great goal mm. so i'm sorry to mention my dad again but that you know his one thing to me after he realized i wasn't going to be an architect was you're not going to work in a factory don't get a job in a factory like he had you know um it's not worth it and so i suppose that's still my ultimate thing not is is that is this idea that i I don't actually. I don't have to go on the tube, and I don't have to go to work. And I don't understand arrogant in that because I'm not rich or anything. But it's, but the, but it's the freedom, isn't it? It's the freedom to be able to yeah. sort of do these things that you want and keep doing them, even if they don't make you wealthy, you know. And so, listening to your war story and his description of your grandfather as a very mean man, who then finds himself in an almost like a karmic uh, situation where. Um, where his meanness is being, um, well, I don't know. Is it? Um, is he? Is he being punished? Or that's funny you should um, say that. Because I never. To me, his meanness. To me, and to all, you know, to my mum, you know, that his daughter, and he he had uh, four, four daughters and a son, and so he had a big family. All lived very close. Because my grandfather lived next door, but one to us, and my mum's sister lived next door to us. So it's this very much like what they used to call an extended community network um we never we just laughed about his meanness it was like a joke you know so he wasn't a bad man at all he's a very nice man he's very funny and very got in a very cruel way but he's very funny um so his meanness uh i think i use that in the story to yeah you're absolutely right i hadn't really considered it but i use it to to to, to Put, to displace him from Eric, or his best friend, you know, through his own, as you, it becomes, all, yes, I dare say biblical, but it becomes almost kind of like allegorical, doesn't it? This, 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 this like a fairy tale or folk tale. Um, uh, but his meanness was an essential part of his character. And I, I, it was just, but it, I can assure you, it was only, we only laughed. It was a it. narrative tool. It was a tool. And a tool in the, you know, this particular story, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But there's lots of things. I mean, again, this... Because I wondered like, whether, because I wondered whether this was a story about meanness, but meanness, but um, uh, I guess maybe it wasn't. Well, to, me, to me, to me, the drive of the story was all, was, was, because I wrote that story, I'd forgotten actually until I started recording it, but about 10 years ago, I'd actually written that story, almost oh, like concrete poetry. And I'd written it, I just did it on a, my computer. And, uh, 
this line of a repetition that have you room for one more? 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 Well, I wrote that as a kind of a kind of, I suppose, when I wrote it originally, I did it as a device because I imagined it as a print, like in a gallery. And um and also I realized immediately it was a like a miniature road movie, you know, that there was potential every time he went to a new tent, there was potential for something strange to happen, which isn't really in this story at all. I did try that, but it it didn't work in that in that format, I don't think. Um but yeah, so the thrust of the story really is that is it was a visual thing almost was that this, this kind of almost like concrete probably this repetition of this same event, same event, same event with different outcomes. When finally you got the kind of almost you know classical fairy tale ending, really. Um, so that was the kind of backbone, lit quite literally and, and visually for me, because I could picture, and hopefully you could when you listen to it, you can picture this row of tents in the desert and this. Yeah. You know, and there's an you know, there's an element, of course, of the, of of of, of uh, the birth of Christ. You know, the the, the Mary and Joseph searching for it in for the night and, and all that. Um, but really, the interesting that came from a visual, a visual thing almost. Did I answer your question? There was that kind of thing to go on. Yeah, there? no, I know. I mean, I was. Um, I guess my my something that I uh, you know in the first half, when the first part of the story, I was kind of expecting to see how. A certain how he'll change, All right? Um, but that wasn't the subject of it. No, he never um, changed. He never changed. No, he got yeah. worse. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I could, that was, I, could that tell was... you lots, I could tell you lots of stories about it, but uh, yeah, he's a very, very funny man. The one word that I have written on top of my notes is Englishness, and it yeah. is something that, in in a kind of weird way, I've seen in your work mm. and it's whether you battle with it well, whether you try to understand it um, and i'm kind of wondering what aspect of it do you take and what aspect of it do you refuse uh because you're also quite uh vocally political am i <laughs> um not enough i don't think um well the political things are another subject for me anyway um, the Englishness is accidental. I would never try, you know, I, I try not to be so English, but it, but, but then I, it just comes out like that, you know. And I have a few themes which are kind of universal, but not, may, not many, perhaps. Um, so I regret my Englishness in a way. I'd love, you know, I'd like to be, I wish I was more like Matt Connors making abstract paintings that had a universality, <laughs> universality to them, you know, because then, you know, I might be successful. But you have to do what you do, don't you, I think, to a degree, or what you're passionate about. And I suppose, if nothing else, I do what I'm passionate about, you know. And I think the only, uh, you know, and let's not pretend, because the financial aspect of that, it's not the be all and end all, but, you know, if I did have a more of a universal language, especially in the world of Instagram, for example, I might be more popular, therefore successful, you know, maybe, I don't know. So it's a bit of a burden, really. Um, and I, but I don't mind, actually, except when it becomes, and it does sometimes becomes too nostalgic, or at least seems to be too nostalgic. Because to me, there's always a critical element to what I do. There's I always a critical element. So I don't yeah, I wouldn't, it's not necessarily I wouldn't nostalgic. About, there's definitely, you know, it's definitely, I de definitely don't trade in nostalgia. There's hopefully always mm. an element of something off or critical. Yeah or comic or, you know, mocking of my own nostalgia or whatever it is, you know, because it's a very dangerous, you know, it's, nostalgia isn't necessarily dangerous, but it, it has many times been used as a weapon against nostalgists, you know, um, by governments. So I think you have to be careful with that. But I, I um, no, I'd, I'd like to be less English. I consider myself to be Yorkshire more than English, you know. Really. Yeah, right. But, right. But, um, Although I don't I've not lived there for thirty years, but I I think although it might seem ridiculous to somebody outside of this tiny island, I think the, the I don't know what Englishness means. To, to, you know, you can think of the cliches of a stiff upper lip and, and and all the terrible things that go with that. But I don't think we're all like that, are we? And in, in the same way, no nationalities can really be condensed into three phrases. You know. Um, I mean, that's amazing to hear. I mean, from my perspective, I'm, I'm, a, I'm foreign anyway, so... Yeah. Is that all you are, just I, foreign? So, but I think, I think in the recent years, the, the Englishness and obviously the national identity has become a, a, a real subject of, uh, of public discourse, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, well, I think it has because obviously that only it's, it's what fueled Brexit largely. I think yeah. much more than any. Well, as we're already seeing by the kind of backlog of wagons and everything else, at, at, mm. uh, you know, in Dover. So much more than a political or financial reality, it was. But it was on the fantasy of this Englishness and this Englishness. It's the Englishness that these people imagined that were victorious in World War Two, somehow alone without American or any other Allied help. It's the it's an Englishness that Nigel Farage painted. It's a kind of Englishness of a Spitfire flying over the white cliffs of Dover, and it's you know, or, or winning the World Cup in 1966, you know, 54 years ago, 55 years ago. You know, it's this fantasy, you know, and it's it's, it's well documented that that attitude, this kind of the post-colonial attitude, you know, is it, that people clung to that for years and years and years, and at a point where we might have finally seemed to be over that particular fantasy, it's been it's raised it's raised its ugly head again, you know. In the form of this kind of wistful nostalgia, rather than the reality, mm -hmm. harsh reality mm -hmm. of you know being a colonial power, which is kind of brutal. It's almost like being in being in despair that you're not what you used to be, and then it's just this there, kind of there is that, final. There's that, you know. But but on the other hand, it's not as simple as you know a kind of you know the Guardian reading North London Liberal might have it, you know, because you know a lot of the you know, and I know this from my friends at home, but a lot you know, and people who voted for Brexit. Um, you know, although, you know, in my opinion, they completely got it wrong, but they, they have been completely disenfranchised, a lot of these people. You know, if you go to towns like where I come from, you know, they're dead towns now, you know, the, the, mm. you know, that the want, you know, all the kind of skilled jobs, not all, but the, you know, a lot of these places, the industry that these towns are built on, it's, you know, it's all been removed systematically since the early 1980s, since Thatcher came into power. And, you know, so you can go to communities in the north, you know, in Wales, in Scotland, you know, where, people do live in poverty and you know, everything has been taken from them and they see that as London you know or you know I mean a lot of my friends felt, felt it was David Cameron and this kind of elite of London and political power that that, 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 that no longer they didn't care about them so they thought they felt by voting Brexit somehow they were reclaiming some kind of power or at least having a voice even though it's in reality it's, you know uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face it was it was a kind of desperate attempt, I think, by many people to to to, to say fuck you to 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 uh, Cameron and to London and to, and to this other thing, you know. And you know, it's going to be bad for everybody by the looks of it. Nobody's going to. So in your work, when when I when the words in your work are they political? I don't think they it, could I, just apply to anything. Well, I don't think I, I shy away from party politics and from real politics, if you like, because it's because it's because when when I see. So, so when I see a poster which says this is shit, I, yeah. I almost, I, almost, I have a feeling that I know what you mean and what yeah. I mean you think is shit, but um, actually, like, how can I know what you mean is shit? No, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, this goes back to me to the pop record again, or the successful pop record. And, you know, that's kind of my dream, really, not just, not literally to make a successful pop record, but, you know, to be able to make something that means everything and nothing, you know? Yeah. And this is shit, of course, from, I was sitting here at this desk looking out the window, in the first lockdown and it was raining and anything I'd been doing had sort of been cancelled and I was just thinking fucking hell I just thought this is shit and and that's just a phrase that I would use endlessly in my mind or say and as we all probably would you know or met most of us and then I typed it into the computer in Futura and I realised shit was an anagram of this immediately and if I centred it in my own sort of type style it became something else it became this circular thing and I immediately thought this is good <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but what but the most exciting thing ultimately as you said is that it's non-specific and of course you know to, to put it out on instagram as i did immediately tragically but not um of course most people why tragically think, well just the you know that needs to that need to feed but ah uh, the need okay need yeah to feed maybe i should do that one. um the but yeah of course within that context of 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 the first stages of COVID and lockdown and things like that. everybody I guess saw it as the same thing as that you know this is this is a shit situation, uh, but of course uh, you know it, so, as you say somebody else could read it completely differently and and to me that's the same with pop music you know if you, you get like do a diddy diddy dum diddy dum you know or any pop song, but uh, it's utterly meaningless, and there used to be this great show in the eighties. Uh, Simon Bates, and it was called Our Tune, uh, and it was like a morning radio. And I used to love it, and it's really sort of sentimental trash. But in this, within his radio show, he'd have this 10 minute slot, which is called Our Tune. And, you know, Jeff from Hartlepool would 
would have written into Simon and said, you know, uh, I, met, I first met Karen in 1968 and this song by Cream was number one and it's our tune, and it, or, you know, and, and to what the point is that people project that pop songs are utterly meaningless, almost all of them, you know, but people project their feelings onto them and it becomes this thing, it goes back to Butlins again, this holiday camp feeling really that you might have, it's often that you've heard that song at a particular time of heightened emotion or excitement you know, like it might be the month that you left school in the hot summer of 1976. It might have been the first time you went to, to, to uh, abroad on holiday. It might have been the first day you met Karen, who became your wife, or you, know, you met Jeff. And and so and we attach meaning to these meaningless songs because they're omnipresent. They're in the air, literally, and we associate them through nostalgia to a great time in our lives, or possibly a really terrible time in our lives. But this song got you through. You know, so. This is shit to me is like my pop hit really because yeah. Yeah. people I, I don't I try not to force it onto people too much although I do too often try and sell it. Um, I you know I, and I wouldn't dare try to attach it to anybody else's political struggle or life struggle. You know I wouldn't do that. But I think the point is as you just said it's an open equation really that you know your it's a mirror of your shit is. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's well, it's it's something that I thought about. I wasn't actually sure whether there was a particular this that you mean, but I kind of felt like I understand you. But at the same time, I think um, well, it's interesting. And I think you know, I just joked about putting it on Instagram, but I, I dare say, without Instagram, I, I might never have made the poster. You know what I mean? So, it, mm, and again, mm. you know, the Instagram. If we go back to the pop analogy. Certainly in the art world now, and I think from lots and lots of people involved in any kind of visual art or not, Instagram is the, the airwaves, isn't it? You know, so for me to make a typographic poster that I think this works, well, the immediate and obvious thing after designing it would be to put it out on the airwaves, like your pop yeah. record, you know, because a pop record has no meaning if it's only played, uh, <clears throat> it has meaning if it's played in a room just to you, but it doesn't, it's not, it's not a pop record by definition, is it? it's not popular <laughs> it's not going to I think popular. this is so this is so interesting because I I was going to talk about earlier in this conversation I was going to I was going to talk about magazines but actually this whether what Instagram is today is a kind of um potentially a democratic uh editor free magazine and that we've all become like magazines in a way mm. yeah well there's an, I think there's an element of that um you know, and it's very Warholian, this idea, and you know, it's, you know, the great again, a great cliche. Everybody will be famous for fifteen minutes, and then that was updated mm -hmm. some years ago. I read it in a book, and I can't remember when. About uh, every, everybody will become famous to fifteen people, which is much more true for the Instagram world. Yeah. I think, you know, so there's an element of that. There's an element of punk. This idea of DIY, of authorship, of being able to say and do what you want within reason, and have an audience, even though it might be fifteen people in your audience. Um, but on the other hand, there's still the Kardashians who got 27 million followers and you've got 27, right? So there's, so although there's a democracy of access, there's not a democracy of audience, of course, because celebrity rules everything now more than ever. And of course, now we live in a world of celebrity for the sake of celebrity, whereas certainly for me, I mean, that must have existed to a degree, but I think famous people tend to be famous for doing something, for mainly. Yeah. Yeah, I've just, written, I've just written a, a, a paragraph on that uh, right. a few days ago. So now we live in this, you know, I'm not criticising it because there's no point, I don't think, or maybe there is, but I certainly wouldn't be petty enough to criticise it within this, within this context because it's just a fact that, mm -hmm. and Instagram particularly, with this kind of lack of written information normally, and, you know, image-based, you know, drive is about, beauty and glamour very often for people isn't it you know and this idea of being an influence or this idea of being famous and, and of course so and it, again, again it, in a way it becomes an, this other cliche which is the McLuhanism of the, the medium is the message doesn't it really because mm. it's actually what, what we're looking at there isn't particularly a message you know it's about the medium it's about the idea to transfer somebody else's life into your life in an instant on Instagram and somehow you're associated with that by following that person, by copying their clothes or makeup or, or you know, liking something they do or whatever it is, uh, you know, so um, it's, so we, we kind of, if we choose to look at things like that, we're endlessly in this endless kind of envelope 
of uh, you know of meaningless well, shit. What, what's also interesting is that by what you uh, follow and what you like, you're actually categorized in a in a well algorithmically categorized yeah, as a yeah. person that will like all these other things. Yeah. So then you're also be, being bombarded with all these other things that you didn't really know you were interested in, right. like. Uh, little lions. <laughs> but my Instagram is, uh, for some reason, the uh, algorithm has worked yeah. out that I would really like little lions. So I just get <laughs> yeah. these little lions all the time. Yeah, that's funny. I, don't, I, I really don't know why. Well, lucky because mine's worked out that I like Liam Gallagher, you know, <laughs> which I don't, you know, at all. But I can't get rid of him. He's just on there. Every time I look at it, there's more and more Liam Gallagher. You know, even when I worked on magazines, when which were monthly magazines. And, you know, starting with ID in, when I worked there in 1993, which is before the internet, as certainly is a mass tool, um, they, I seem to remember that the news sections were valid, but became increasingly less so as the magazine moved more towards um, other things. Like, I'm just going to say other things. By the time I was doing Sleaze Nation magazine, which was about 2001, 2002, when people had the internet, the, the, the news was very, very little, and it was all about something else. It was about a bigger idea. And I'm talking about very small magazines. I'm not talking about, you know, mass, you know, important, so big circulation magazines. I'm talking about small niche magazines, really. Um, so, of course, in, in order for magazines, well, ultimately, in order for magazines to exist now, or always, they needed advertising. And, the, and I always saw them, perhaps cynically, but I think not untrue, that I saw them as kind of like, Littlewood's catalogs, you know, there was, there was in the same way that, you know, it's been said many times that, you know, commercial TV is really just about the, the adverts and the programs are the secondary thing. You're really watching the adverts and that's just a truism. You know, it's not untrue. That's how commercial TV started in the US. Um, and I think for Central Magazines that without the Calvin Klein ad or without the kind of big, you know, without the, you know, for example, even Vogue or whatever, you know, without them carrying this mass of high fashion, very expensive advertising, well, of course they wouldn't exist, you know. So I think for me, any conversation about magazines or not, you know, not fanzines, but commercial magazines should start with advertising. And at the point that advertisers oh. decide they don't want to do print advertising, then there will be no more magazines of that ilk because the sales wouldn't carry them through, you know. So magazines exist on a combination of selling the magazine itself and of course ad revenue and mainly ad revenue so the reason we still have them is because advertisers still advertise in them um and without that we wouldn't have magazines that we know them i don't think i had this idea because magazine as a uh, as an object is a kind of statement or yeah. a cross-section of society or a moment in time right yeah. when it's published and it doesn't yeah. get reprinted like books do that's true um, yeah. And I almost wonder whether that, that there is something quite healthy in that and whether um, it's almost like a model for creative practice. Um, well, I mean, the potential is enormous, isn't it, for a magazine? You know, because, you, know, you know, and I think that rather than it being a kind of, rather than the fact that we're now constantly bombarded with information, you know, rather than thinking, well, that means the magazine is invalid, I think I, I agree with what I think you're suggesting, which is that actually could validate the magazine as something of substance. Mm. It doesn't necessarily happen, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the idea that the magazine doesn't no longer deals with and can't possibly keep up with the news. If they used to, even a monthly magazine used to have the news of sorts. Um, and of course, newspapers can no longer keep up with the news. A printed newspaper is out of date before yeah. it's even printed. So, so it's not dissimilar, perhaps, to a painting in a gallery, where if you thought of the magazine as an artwork of some kind, whether it be a satirical artwork or whether it be, uh, as you say, a mirror of society at that time and something more, more precious and something that will exist as a physical object and can be kept on your shelf as a memory or as a, a, a whatever it is. I think that's very exciting what you suggested as an idea because that's the only, you know, except for the ad revenue and the business of a magazine, let's say culturally, that's really the only significance a magazine could have right now, I think. So that's a very exciting idea. The idea might, maybe becomes more like the slither of a novel in the same way, you know, Dickens, it's not dissimilar to Dickens actually, because Dickens, the original Dickens stories were, were, were published like weekly or something like that. The, you know, you didn't get the Pickwick papers all in one go. They were, they, were, they were separated into parts and chapters. And in the same way we watched, we used to watch TV series, you know. Yeah. So a magazine itself could become a slither of a chapter, a slither of a, a small mirror of, that, of January, a small mirror of February, you know, it could be like that. Therefore, you could build 
a great picture of the world, or a version of the world. Um, but I don't know if anybody really does that. I think it, this comes back to the pop song again, because most, so most magazines so vacuous and so celebrity and product driven that you'd have to be, you'd have to be, you'd have to have a very good X-ray vision really to see uh, anything beyond the content that they were presenting. But you'd have to almost look at it like Bart. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, and the same Bart looked at steak and chips uh, in 1950s Paris, and from steak and chips. He, he, write, you know, he managed to write about a whole culture. Or he wrote about the, the meaning of red wine in France, you know, or the meaning of wrestling. And it's all in mythologies, where, you know, it's a, he becomes almost like a scientist, and he puts an element of culture, an element of the normal world, under his microscope, and he expands on that. And I think, you know, a magazine has the potential to do that, uh, but I've not seen it doing that personally. But then again, I'm not right up on magazines. There might be some amazing magazine now that is doing that. So the hotel room was in Turin, I think it was about 2013, 2014. And um, I, I, I think they asked like four or five artists to do a room each of a theme of your own choice. And I decided very quickly to do it as a room for a friend of mine who died in 2008 and he was called Nick Sanderson. And he was the lead singer of this amazing band, Little Brutus, who I go on, on and on and on about if you ever look at my Instagram or anything. Yes, or, yes. or if you're unfortunate enough to meet me. Um, and yeah, Nick died in 2008. So I just wanted to make this room that I wanted, that I imagine Nick would have liked to stay in. So it wasn't like a memorial to him. It was a, a I was really making a room that I, if he'd been alive, that I would have loved him to be able to stay in because he had things that were all personal to him. He had things, you know, and it, there was a lot, and lots of jokes between us and stuff like that were in there. And, and amazingly, I found it very, very easy to do. And in a way, I think that room particularly maybe is what set me off recently on doing these additions. You know, because I very much like the idea of stuff that isn't real art. You know, I am genuinely more interested in, I think, in the Tate store, you know, the Tate knickknack shop that sells shit, than I am in often in what's been exhibited in, in the real gallery, you know, because I, 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 for many reasons, but I, I just am. And so for doing this, doing this room for Nick, I did things like, there was a thing called uh, A Lamp, Are We Not Men, which is just a cheap concrete bust of Caesar, uh, um, big one. With a, with a Devo Power Dome hat. I don't know if you know D, the Devo hats, the, the, the post-punk mm -hmm. hat. And, and that becomes a lampshade and inside there's a bulb and, the, and, and the, it's elect, you know electrical cable. And so it's just things like that, which is kind of a ready-made almost, but it was all, I find it really easy to do because I had this kind of, um, I had a very specific target audience, which was Nick. And Nick, tragically, wasn't even there to complain about what I was doing. So um, that, to me, is a really good thing to do. And it's what I've tried to continue, I'm trying to continue doing really with these additions is, is uh, you know, I'm very interested in the in-between of things. My memory could be wrong, but my I'm sorry to mention another friend of mine who died, but another Nick who I, was, who I grew up with, he went to a college in Newcastle in the late eighties and he won an RSA travel award, that the top prize in 1990, I think. Um, Anyway, he travelled around Japan and became a really diver soon afterwards. But his great ambition was to go to the Architectural Association. That was his obsession. Wow. So I only knew about the Architectural Association because of my friend Nick, Nicky. And he gave me a catalogue. And I think it was, it, well, I know it was, it was an Architectural Association produced catalogue. And then he had this word, which I always remember as Taschenwelt, a German word, which I'm never quite sure of the meaning of. But I understood it to mean the space in between things. And this would have been in 1990. And I started thinking about... It was a golden age, actually. It was a golden era of the AA. Was it? Yeah. Because he, I mean, yeah. it looks so exciting, the AA. Uh, from the it's a very exciting place. It's a, yeah, it's a very non-architectural, architectural that, school. That's what was exciting about it. And I think... To it it still is. It still is. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, this word, Taschenwald, it, 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 as it was written in this catalogue, as I understood it, it became, it was about the space in between things. And I started making a project about the space in between TV channels. Which was, just, which was just me trying to, in my crappy house in Hull, where I was at college, trying to photograph the gap when you turn from ITV no, to the one. So that gap, and I was trying to imagine what was in that gap. And that's what really led me consciously to doing the, what I do, which is, you know, because what I do is not really art at all, but it's ne neither is it design. And, there's this, it's, and it's not this idiot phrase design art that that guy invented. It's nothing like that. It's about stuff that cannot quite be categorized. And that's what excites me, you know? So it's always, you know, pop music that's too arty to be pop music or possibly vice versa. Um, 